name is Francesca Finelli, and I am Associate Director of Graduate Career Development at the Office of Graduate Career Development named GSAS Compass. You're watching the first video in a series about effective application materials. Our first presentation will talk about the resume, one of the most important parts of searching for a job. Um, it's an element that in, it's often the first thing that an employer sees and the first thing you might share with someone you hope to network with. So making sure that you're getting the resume right is incredibly important. So today we'll be talking about perfecting the resume. Today's has a few presentation goals. I hope you walk away with some a strong understanding of what makes an effective resume. So our goals for today are creating a compelling resume that will land you an interview, because as I said, it's often the first thing an employer reviews. So if they're reviewing a resume and they're interested enough, they'll often bring you in for an interview. I'd like you to learn about applicant tracking systems. This is a new system or a relatively new system that employers are using to scan applicants as they're coming in. It is a computer system that does the scanning. I'll get into this more later, but it's kind of really gamifying the process of applying to jobs. And then I'd like you to understand how to create a tailored resume in response to a specific job ad. I think this is often where people get into trouble. They'll say, I've applied to 200 jobs and I never received a response. It's probably because you're not doing this tailoring. And so we'll discuss that um, in response to uh, how to make a really specific resume that corresponds to a very specific job ad. First, I wanted to start off with a little quote, because again, I think this kind of really explains resumes. Your resume and cover letter are your marketing materials. They will get you through the door and help you land your dream job. Hiring managers or recruiters will only skim over these resumes and cover letters for a few seconds. So it is extremely important to take the time to perfect these documents. And this was something that was shared with me by Julia Vaida, who is the head of people operations at Teach for All. Um, she was kind enough to share these quotes with me. And it's something that I use in every presentation because I think they really get to the point of an effective resume. They're marketing materials. Hiring managers are skimming them. So they need to be easy to read and really important that you're spending time kind of perfecting these documents. So first I wanna make very clear what the difference between a resume and a CV is. Sometimes you'll see these two terms used interchangeably because um, people writing job descriptions aren't always hiring managers or career development professionals. As a career development professional, I very know, I very clearly know the difference between a resume and a CV. And so I want you to know the difference as well. But if you see someone saying, send me a cover letter and a CV for this job application, that's not an academic job then you must use a resume, which is a one to two page document. I am starting to see more and more two page resumes, which I think is great. It allows you a little more space and room to highlight your skills and your experience. I suggest not going any farther than, th than two pages, because again, as we saw at the beginning of this presentation, most employers only skim your documents. And if there's a third page, they might not even get to that third page. So I really highly recommend that you keep it at least to two pages. There are some industries where a one page resume is really uh, required. So that would be consulting, that would be finance positions, and that would also be positions within the tech world. You don't wanna go farther than two pages because again, hiring managers probably won't even get to that second page. However, if you're applying for positions at maybe a think tank or a research center or an area, a, a type of job that really requires a lot of reading and writing, writing emails, a two page resume can uh, be something that is absolutely acceptable and most employers will wanna see a second page. So if you're in doubt about do I do a one page resume, a two page resume? Um, you can always schedule an appointment with GSAS Compass staff, uh, an advising appointment. You can do that through the GSAS Compass portal. And there you can meet with a career development professional to ask all your specific questions about resumes. But for right now, as I mentioned, rule of thumb, if you're applying to positions in finance or tech or consulting, make sure you keep it to one page. Other jobs, I think two page 
application or two page resume is more acceptable. And it's a quick summary of your skills and your experiences. I call it the highlight reel. So it's not everything you've ever done. Um, you know, it might not include that time that you were a waitress uh, or excuse me, a, a server at a, you know, a restaurant because it's maybe not related to the specific, specific role that you are applying to. So you want to make sure that you're being, uh, you're thinking and reflecting about your experiences. Are they related to the job? And um, if they are not, maybe removing them from the resume to make sure that you're keeping it nice and short. And as I mentioned, it's best for applying to most industry positions. Do keep in mind that this presentation is about roles um, that are outside of academia. So these are not roles uh, like a faculty position, or a postdoc position. Um, any of those roles, uh, you would need something called a CV um, or a curriculum vitae, which is a much more comprehensive description of your academic and professional credentials. This can be multiple pages and often it is. I've seen very, very long CVs. Um, and again, you use this for really applying to more academic or um, research positions, perhaps within a university. If you're applying for a research position at a think tank, you'll probably still want to keep it to two pages at maximum. Um, so keep in mind that, again, uh, more academic positions requires a CV, which is much more extensive. And as I mentioned, can be multiple pages. So resume is what you're going to be using to applying to most posi positions, while a CV you're going to be using for academic roles. Um, Again, if you see a position at a tech company and they're asking for a CV and a cover letter or just a CV, make sure that you send that resume. You're probably going to, to see that language used interchangeably. But now you know the difference between a resume and a CV. So what should be included in a resume? So these are the most basic information about what you want to include on a resume. You can get as fancy as you want later on, but these are the most basic things, which is your contact information. How do they contact you if they want to bring you in for an interview? So include your name, your street address. Um, I've actually seen physical addresses become less common on applications. So if you prefer to leave out your physical street address, that is okay, but make sure you have an email number, uh, excuse me, an email address and a phone number. Those are the most important. So name, email address, phone number, phone number. And then if you have a, a personal website or a LinkedIn page, include links to those as well, um, because sometimes an employer might be interested enough to want to click through to your LinkedIn page. And your LinkedIn page can really include an entire listing of your employment history. My LinkedIn page is quite long. It goes back to the beginning of my work history in 2008. Um, I don't include that 2008 position on my resume if I'm applying to jobs. So if someone is interested enough, they might want to click through and, and see uh, your, your LinkedIn profile or your personal website. So typically next, after contact information, we'll see education. Because all of you are in graduate school right now or have recently graduated, it might make sense for you to put education next. If you have extensive work experience, and I'm talking about like five to six years of work experience, you might consider putting work experience before your education. But if you're really at the beginning of your career, then it makes sense to have education second. And so you want to list your undergraduate degrees and above. Often I see high school listed, you don't need to include that anymore. Um, again, you're, you're getting your graduate degree, so it's usually bachelor's degree or your undergraduate degree, and then your graduate level degree. Include the dates of attendance. Most of the time people like to know what period of time did you attend um, school. So I like to include both month and year as well so that they know when you're starting and ending. Also, next, as I mentioned, experience, very, very important. So include both paid and unpaid work. I think people often get caught up in this idea of experience um, needing to be only paid work. That's not the case. Uh, and we'll talk about later in this presentation about how to present your graduate education under experience as well. But you want to include paid and unpaid work, internships, volunteer experiences, anything, as I mentioned, that's related to the job. Include the organization name, location, dates of employment, and your title. We'll see an example of a resume a little bit later that includes all of this information. 
Underneath each experience, you should include a brief description of your accomplishments and bullet points. In a moment, we'll get to writing a really strong bullet point because this is very important, um, but you wanna make sure that you start each bullet point with an action verb. You don't wanna use full sentences on a resume because again, a hiring manager is just skimming the information very quickly, right? So um, don't want to include full sentences. You want to use action verbs uh, right at the beginning of that bullet point. And then both education and experiences should be listed in reverse chronological order. This is the way that hiring managers will expect to see the information listed. Reverse chronological order means the most recent followed by least recent experiences. So Columbia would go above your undergraduate degree in reverse chronological order. So I mentioned that I was going to get into writing bullet points with impact. This is incredibly important because again, uh, the resume is a highlight of your skills and your experiences. And how do you do that? You show your skills and your experiences through bullet points. So one method that is suggested to kind of keep yourself organized with writing a very strong bullet point is to use the STAR method, um, which helps you be as specific as possible with a, a role that you held and the tasks that you completed. So STAR stands for situation. So you start with what was the situation, problem, or conflict you were facing in a particular role you held? What tasks did you identify in response to this situation? What actions did you take? And that's when you start with your action verb at the bullet point. And then result. What was the result or outcome of your action? How did it benefit the organization? Can these results be quantified? Certain employers really like to see, um, or all employers really like to see not only what you did, but what impact you had upon an organization. And if you can quantify that, even better. So let's look at the difference between a generic and a specific bullet point. So here's a generic description. This person was an events coordinator at a public health society, and they just said, responsible for organizing events and panels. So this isn't very clear exactly what they did. They really, you know, I don't know what types of events, how often those events are being done for what audience. There's just not enough information. It's really vague. It's not painting a picture of what you did at this role as events coordinator at the Public Health Society. Here's a very specific description. So this one bullet point now becomes three. And we can see that they're starting with action verbs, different action verbs each time. And this is much more specific. So this person said plan and coordinate panels on public health for audiences of 25 to 50 under undergraduates on a bi-monthly basis. So I know how often these events are being held, who is the audience, how large is the audience, and what are the topics being discussed in these panels. The next bullet says identify and contact health professionals in the community to participate in panels. I didn't get any of that information in the previous single bullet point. Now I have an understanding that this person is acting as a liaison between their organization and those in the community, asking them to come in, probably corresponding with people, writing emails, um, scheduling with people. Those are all skills that a lot of employers look for. And so that bullet point is very important and tells an employer so much more about what you did at that role and what skills you developed. And then finally, create marketing materials and publicize events through social media. Again, something that wasn't at all apparent in that single bullet point. So here, you know, you're creating marketing materials, you know how to use social media. It's just so much more illustrative of what is being done in this role at this specific organization. So always try to be as specific as possible with your bullet points and try to paint a picture for your reader to let them know what exactly you did in a specific role. So the next step is impact, right? So they not only want to know about your skills, employers not only want to know about your skills um, and what you did at a role, but what was your impact on an organization or a company? So be specific. So this is a, an example of a specific but not, but not results-oriented bullet point. So it says create marketing materials and publicize events through social media. We saw that in the previous slide, right? So that was a good bullet point, but let's see if we can uh, make it even stronger by showing how it impacted an organization. So here's how to make a high impact bullet point. So if you can quantify, this is great. 
Create marketing materials and publicize events through social media. Increase attendance at several club programs by 75%. So again, we're quantifying, we're being very specific here. Sometimes you can't quantify, so you have to qualify the information. So you can just say, saw increased attendance at several clubs throughout the year. That's okay. If you don't have a specific number, that's all right. But if you can show that you had an impact by just increasing attendance, that's an excellent thing to show an employer. So the first step is always showing what you did, being very specific, and then also thinking, how did I impact this organization? Are there any ways to show my results? And include those in your bullet points as well. So one of the things that we get asked most often during advising appointments is, I'm not sure exactly what skills I have as a graduate student. So it, you are developing so many important skills here at GSAS. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of reframing uh, and uh, reimagining the skills that you're developing here. You're not just attending classes and reading and writing and um, you know talking to classmates. You're actually doing a whole range of, you're developing a whole range of skills that employers will find really valuable. So sometimes it's just understanding the language and how to present your skills to an employer. So research. Um, everyone is doing research here at, at GSAS. And so here's some ways that you can explain your research skills to an employer. You're determining the best approach to a question. You're finding relevant data. You're designing a way to analyze it. You're understanding large amounts of data. And when I say data, this could be a spreadsheet of numbers, or it could also be an archive of uh, source materials that you're using. You're reading a lot of material and then you're synthesizing that information. So consider data not only to just be numbers, but also words and reading and information. And then of course, synthesizing your findings, persuading others to defend your conclusions. So these are skills that are required in any workplace really. These are what we like to call durable skills. Durable skills versus skills that have a time limit on them are often skills that have a time limit on them are ones that uh, such as like certain programming languages. They're prevalent and popular for a period of time, but then over a couple of years, maybe that programming language will become obsolete and people don't use it anymore. So that's something that has a timestamp on it. Whereas a durable skill, such as learning how to um, take in large amounts of data and then synthesize it, is one that is durable and will take you and help you over the course of your career. Written communication. So this is writing papers for classes, writing a thesis, a dissertation, which so many of you do. Again, project management. How do you take a huge project, like writing a thesis or a dissertation, and break it down into small, actionable steps? Or how do you do? Uh, how do you um, work with a group to create a project that you're analyzing data and then visualizing that data in a dashboard? How do you do that? You have to do project management. You have to assign tasks to people, or if you're just working alone, you have to take a large project and break it down into small, actionable steps. That is project management. Leadership, so that's mentoring or teaching others. So if you're a TA or a research assistant, that can be part of um, being collaborative or being a leader um, and working with others. Critical thinking, again, something that all of you are doing. So how to approach problems systematically, see links between ideas, evaluate arguments, analyze information to draw your own conclusions. Collaboration. Again, this is something that a lot of you do. It might not be, um, I know often PhD students, once they're in dissertation or writing phase, everything starts to be quite individual, but you're still collaborating with others. You're still maybe teaching. Um, and so uh, knowing how to divide up a task, having a good relationship with others, communicating effectively is one of the key skills that employers look for, effective communication clear communication. And these are things that all of you are developing here at GSAS. And then finally, of course, public speaking, that could be a class presentation, conference talks, posters, presentations, and again, teaching. So these are skills that all of you are developing and could be an excellent bullet point on a resume. So how to feature your graduate education on your resume? So as I mentioned, kind of reframe, redefine experience. Your graduate degree is a job. 
And we'll see an example of how one person featured their graduate degree on their resume a little bit later in this presentation. So you want to feature coursework or academics, projects in education to give your employer a better understanding of your degree. Sometimes certain um, programs actually see a project section on their resume. So they might have experience um, such as like internships that they've held and then underneath that project experience, um, whereas they're learning specific skills in their program and they might be um, developing certain uh, projects that would be very, that are specifically related to the types of roles that they're now applying to. So featuring those projects and those experiences uh, on your resume. So here's a way to uh, list either your thesis or your dissertation under experience with bullet points. So manage a year long thesis project, wrote an X page thesis dissertation on subject of, and then keep it very short, led lecture and seminar size classes, conducted archival research, developed a novel procedure. These are all great actionable items that an employer would see as um, related to the work that they are doing in their office. So as I mentioned, volunteer positions or unpaid positions should be featured. So these could be, maybe you're part of the ASGC or the, the student government here at GS. Maybe you are a research assistant. These are all really valuable experiences that you want to feature. Maybe you're part of the, um, you know, a soccer club here at Columbia. That could also be something that you're featuring on the resume. So another way to feature and to highlight your skills on a resume is to use section headers. So this is, I'd say a more advanced version of resume writing. So I often get the question um, because you know everything needs to be listed in reverse chronological order on your resume. So sometimes students will say, you know, I have this really great related experience um, or experience that's very closely related to the job that I'm applying to. But you know, I did it about four years ago, and I want to put it at the top of my resume, but I don't know how to do that because you have to list everything in reverse chronological order. So instead, you can use section headers. And here's some way to highlight. So you can have a section header with experiences listed underneath them, another section header with experiences listed underneath them. So even if you have experience that's really related, that's older, you can create a section header such as research experience or perhaps laboratory experience or curatorial experience. Put that as the first section header, list your experiences. Next section header could be research experience. And then you have the more recent research experience and it can be placed underneath because you're using a very clever section header. These section headers also allow you to get keywords into your resume, very fe featured very prominently. Um, and keywords again are important for tailoring. It's also important for applicant tracking systems, which we'll get to in a moment. What else should a resume include? I keep on talking about leadership, volunteer experiences, also skills are incredibly important. And I am talking here about usually what we call hard skills. So these are skills such as computer skills, technical skills, lab skills, research skills. So um, particularly for uh, skill heavy roles, such as technical roles, data analyst, data scientist, you'll probably want to feature skills very prominently on your resume. Sometimes I see contact information followed by education and then skills listed right underneath. For roles that are not so skill heavy, I typically see skills at the bottom of the page. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have any skills. I'm sure you know how to use Microsoft Word. I'm sure that you know how to use Microsoft Excel. I'm sure that you know how to use social, certain social media sites. Employers still like to see that information on your resume. I often hear, doesn't everyone have these skills? That's not always the case. And sometimes an applicant tracking system might be scanning your resume for specific keywords related to Word or Excel. So you wanna make sure that those words and those skills are featured on your resume. I also strongly suggest we have a large international student population here at Columbia. Mention the other languages that you speak. Um, you speak English and then what other languages do you speak? So that could be uh, often I see uh, skills and languages and someone might list their skills and then have another uh, uh, bullet point listing their languages. So make sure that you're hiding, highlighting any other languages you speak. 
Optional sections include a profile or a summary up at the top of your resume. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit more. Any honors that you've received um, or awards or grants. Um, and if you are applying to specific jobs that ask for a record of your publications, you might want to include a short selection of your publications. So I mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit about resume summaries. I think that these are incredibly helpful if you have an eclectic background, several years of experience, are in the process of changing careers, or just to take the place of a cover letter. So many places aren't even requiring cover letters anymore, or applications aren't even asking for them. And a summary is a really nice way to have a short narrative at the top of your resume that includes specific keywords and highlights your skills. It allows the reader to kind of set up their understanding of the rest of your resume. So it should be really brief and it should be a, a snapshot of your skills, your experiences, your accomplishments. And again, I'll show you a professional summary a little bit later in the presentation. It should connect your background with a position or a field. It should be, as I mentioned, short, so only two to five phrases. It could be written in paragraph form or in bullets. This is the only place where I suggest writing in sentences if you decide to do that. The rest of your resume should be in bullet points. And so here's some section headers. Um, you could say summary of qualifications, career profile. Sometimes you don't even have to write anything. You could just have the words listed and then you know the rest of your experience. And as I mentioned, it's not necessary if you're a current student or a recent graduate with a background that directly connects with your target industry. So let's say you're a student in statistics and you studied statistics in your undergraduate and now you're applying to positions and in finance. That makes sense. I don't think you necessarily need to have a summary at the top of your resume. So this is again, a more advanced feature of a resume. Not every resume will feature these. And these are things that you can elect to put on your resume or not. So here's a couple things that you should not include on your resume. And these are really important. No personal information. I know sometimes in certain countries, they require photographs. In the United States, photographs are actually looked down upon. You're not supposed to include a photograph on your resume. So make sure that that is not included. Your age, your marital status, your number of children, uh, inappropriate email address. And so I'm saying here that's like a, um, you know, hot Cheetos 99 at hotmail.com. Um, that's not an appropriate email address. If you don't have another email address, besides Hot Cheetos 99, um, then maybe you want to just include your Columbia email address instead. And most certainly do not include your social security number. That's something that you should really only keep inside your head or, or have uh, that social security card locked in a very safe place. Uh, beware of repetition of words. So sometimes I see uh, responsible for or duties included at every bullet point. That gets so boring. There aren't many words on a resume. It's really short. Don't bore your reader. So try to uh, use as many different uh, action verbs as you can. Be creative. As I mentioned, don't use full sentences unless you're in a summary section. Don't include references unless they are required or asked for in the job description. Typically, if you want to, you could put references available upon request on the last uh, you know, at the bottom of your, of your final page. So that would be at the bottom of your first page or the bottom of your second page. Um, or you could bring a separate list of references. This is personally what I do. I have a separate document with my contact information at the top and then I list my references on that. So I'll include that as part of, as part of an application. Don't waste precious space on a resume with references. And then of course, you don't wanna have any typos, spelling mistakes or grammatical errors. Um, have someone look over your resume. That could be a GSAS Compass staff member. That could be your mom, your cousin, your friend. Get as many eyes on your resume as possible. And um, if, you know, an extra, uh, you know, bonus here is that if you're in an interview, excuse me, uh, if, you're, if you're networking with someone, uh, who's working in the industry that you're interested in, having a conversation with them, maybe show them your resume, 
get get their input and uh, in a very low stake situation. It's not an interview, right? You're just kind of chatting with this person. So uh, get many, many eyes on your resume and try to uh, really um, make sure that you don't have any of these errors. So some common mistakes that I often see, which is just overselling yourself. Please be truthful about your abilities and your skill set on a resume. Um, starting uh, by you know not being truthful on your resume or overselling your skills can really get you into trouble within the workplace. If you say you have certain skills um, and then you show up in the job and you don't actually have those, um, those will be uh, you know create a lot of trouble for you. So not putting in the most important information first. Um, so, you know, again, I mentioned those different section headers. If there's some experience that you have that's really relevant to the job, uh, but it's a little bit older, use a different section header to push that to the top of the page. As I mentioned, don't include old or irrelevant experience. So I consider anything old that's like um, probably after 2017 at this point, unless it's directly related to the job. So uh, just, you know, again, snapshot, remove anything that's that's too old or not relevant. So um, maybe that, that you know, that job that you had as a server um, back in 2012, <laughs> uh, it probably doesn't need to be on, on your resume anymore. Um, and then don't crowd your resume with too much text. It really discourages discourages people from reading it. And don't use abbreviations or technical words that a recruiter might not understand. Um, so I'm thinking about particularly perhaps those in the sciences who are using very specific methods within their lab. Um, that might not pertain to what an employer is doing. So try to be more general. And if you're using a specific method or highlighting a specific method, make sure to not just use the abbreviation and actually spell it out. So as I mentioned, tailoring, tailor, tailor, tailor. This is so important. This takes time. This means that you can't just create one resume and send it out to you know hundreds of different places. Um, I, I, you know that that's not successful because of applicant tracking systems. Of you know an employer will look at your resume and say, oh, did they even read the job description? None of this information is relevant. Tailoring takes time, but it is more likely if you tailor your resume you're more likely to get interview requests. So take the extra time to perfect these documents, these marketing materials, and um, they will yield much better results than a resume that you just send to a hundred of hundreds of different places and you're not changing a word of it when you're applying. So how do we tailor a resume? The first thing is review the job description very closely. When I am applying to a job that I'm really, really interested in, I like to actually, um, I used to print it, now I'd probably just PDF it, and I'll highlight specific words. I'm like, okay, these are the words that I need to make sure get in my resume, get in my cover letter. Then reflect on your experiences. And again, think about, okay, if your job description is looking for XYZ, when have there been times in my career when I've used XYZ? okay, let me make sure that that information is on my resume and let me think about ways that I can push it to the top of the page. Use keywords. Again, as I mentioned, can you rearrange sections and then sit down and write it after you've done some reflection. Uh, again, I think people just kind of dive into these things without really, without really thinking. Career development really takes a, a lot of reflection, something that some people don't like to spend the time doing, but I promise you, if you spend the time doing this, reviewing the job description, then thinking about your experience and then thinking about how you can put that on your resume, it's going to yield really, you'll have more success with that resume. So it is helpful to create a template. You might find that you're applying to a lot of jobs as a data analyst or curatorial assistant. Your curatory, as well as maybe you're applying to curatorial assistant roles and then editor positions. Your editor resume is going to look different than your curatorial assistant resume. And so you might find that you have a curatorial assistant, uh, uh, an editor resume that you use, and then still tweak and change every time that you apply to a new editor job. Uh, and then I see a curatorial assistant job, oh, I'll use that template and then still change it and then send it off. So as I mentioned, having different versions. And then of course, have other people look at it. 
come to GSAS Compass, schedule a resume review with us, talk to a mentor, talk to a friend, talk to someone working in the field and get their feedback. All right, so now I've been talking a lot about applicant tracking systems, so let me explain what they are. Applicant tracking systems, ATSs or ATS, that's the shorthand, that's what I often use. So these are systems that more and more companies are using to actually scan your resume and then they score your resume based on qualifications from the job description and they rank your application. So 90% of Fortune 500 companies use ATS and 75% of these candidates are actually phased out of consideration because they're not using keywords. They're not following the job description. And so again, if you're sending out, maybe you're sending out your resume, same resume every time, um, and you're not tailoring, the applicant tracking system will just reject you automatically. So make sure that you are doing this tailoring. And then use keywords and exact phrases from the job description. I often suggest just copying and pasting information from a job description into your resume. Make sure it isn't messing up your formatting, but if you copy and paste, that's a great way to make sure that you're using the same exact language as the job description. Um, People often say, isn't that plagiarism? You're all graduate students. You want to make sure you're not plagiarizing information without citing it. That's great, but within this system, uh, you're actually, plagiarism is encouraged. <laughs> you want to copy and paste information into your resume to make it sure uh, and relate to that job description. Um, and then you wanna use keywords and exact phrases. As I mentioned, uh, you could use a summary statement to really utilize keywords. So let's say um, that you don't necessarily, you're applying to a job that you have most of the qualifications, but one thing is missing. Let's say you don't have experience with managing um, another uh, employee. Instead on your resume, you could say, um, you know, in your summary statement at the top of your resume, um, interest in, managing other individuals. So you, you have the word manage and on your resume and you're being truthful because you're saying that you have an interest in, but you have the keyword to make sure that you're getting past that applicant tracking system. So as I said, all of this has kind of been gamified um, and you have to use strategy and, and your critical thinking skills to think about how can I get as many keywords from the job description on my resume. And a summary is a great way to do that. Use simple formats and layouts. I used to, in the past, put my contact information in the header of a page. That way it saved me space. It looked nice because it was kind of a watermark. I really liked it. And I would suggest that to other students. Then I watched a video about applicant tracking systems. And I learned that these applicant tracking systems cannot scan the header or the footer of a page. So do not put information in the header or a footer of a page. They'll miss really important information. So this was something that I learned. And so make sure that you're using a simple layout. Sometimes I see uh, resumes that look like they have been designed by a graphic designer. It looks really nice, but sometimes applicant tracking systems have a hard time scanning those fancy resumes. So simple is better. And then also sometimes applicant tracking systems will also search the internet for your social media presence. And, uh, and they might scan your uh, LinkedIn profile as well. These things are getting more and more, um, you know, smart, intelligent. So um, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is looking really good. This is again, something that we can cover during a GSAS Compass career advising appointment. And then finally, um, Try JobScan. This is a really cool website, www.jobscan.com, where you can put in, you can copy and paste a job description, copy and paste your resume into the system, and then it will compare and contrast to see how closely you are aligning your job description with the, uh, I mean, your resume with the job description. It probably does a better job than me even because I'm not a computer. So um, it is a, a really good resource with learning how to uh, better make or make your resume uh, scannable. Okay, so let's spend some time looking at a sample. I'm grabbing these samples, oops. Let me, okay, I'm just gonna reshare my screen here. And so the samples that I will be showing you today are from a website called Imagine PhD. In the title, 
it says PhD, but I think that this website is really very helpful for our MA students as well. Um, and this is where you can kind of create a career plan. You can take career assessments. There's so many resources here. But the main thing I want to share with you are these job family resources. You can learn about many different jobs and roles and in industries and um, kind of is also see sample application materials. So today, research and analysis, this is something so many of our students do. So I'm gonna go into here. So you can learn about this field. You can learn about how to connect to others doing this type of work, what skills you can be building, but as well, how to apply to specific positions within this industry. And in here, you'll be able to find a job description, which has been analyzed, keywords are highlighted, and then a resume and a cover letter written in response to this very specific job. So. Um, I'm going to now uh, show you PDFs because I think it'll be easier to see these together. So here is a job description with information that has been highlighted and featured. So we're looking here at a job description for a researcher at Frameworks Institute. And so Imagine PhD has done the work of highlighting information for you to seeing what those keywords are. Um, and then making notes about why they are uh, important. So, um, you know, the to advance, uh, this is a kind of a mission driven organization. So they're looking for someone to conduct, interpret and explain communication research to advance the solution of resolution of social problems. So you want to make sure that you're addressing that in your resume. They're looking for someone who has done data collection, analysis, and interpretation and reporting of content and findings to a strategic frame analysis. So, um, you know, make sure to be uh, familiarize yourself with these tools. What is that? Uh, and, and, and how might, if you don't have a uh, specific knowledge of this, do you know something that's similar to the strategic frame analysis? Also significant experience using a range of research methods, analyzing data on broad range of topics, and then the requirements. So they want a master's degree required. They're also looking for a PhD though, training in, uh, training significant experience in conducting qualitative or quantitative research and analysis, demonstrated ability to distill and interpret complicated research findings, create clear high quality products for non-academic audiences, strong writing and presentation skills, analytical, logical, and organizational abilities, experience bringing implications from social science research to bear on applied questions and issues, and working in an interdisciplinary setting, synthesizing and interpreting the results. So, and again, interpret, interpret, interpret. We see a lot of interpret, repeated words. That's also a really great key skill here. So, um, again, you can go to Imagine PhD, see the full job description, really get into a lot of these um, bubbles here. But I just wanted to show you quickly what the job description was and then what the resume that we're going to take a look at. So here we go. So we have Eve Davis. And Eve has a professional summary at the top of her resume where she's able to really highlight those key skills. So again, advanced proficiency in qualitative and quantitative methods. Remember, we read that from the job description. Commitment to building support for social issues. Remember, mission-driven organizations want to know how your um, interests and your values align with theirs. And she's putting that right up in the professional summary. And applied experience in advocacy organizations. So I've worked in advocacy organizations. Excellent communication skills with a focus on effective strategies to craft persuasive arguments and address a range of specialists and generalist audiences. So I'm pretty sure this is taken exactly from the job description. Here's the education section. For those of you who have a PhD, you just have to list the PhD. You don't necessarily have to list the MPhil and the MA that you're receiving along the way. And then of course, only the BA is listed. Then here we go, experience doctoral candidate. So putting your, you know, your, uh, you could say master's candidate, doctoral candidate right on your resume. And so uh, here we go, as we talked about before, how do you feature it? So conduct extensive research on history of immigration, focusing on policy, media sources, and popular beliefs. So a quick overview of the work that you're doing, trained in interdisciplinary tools and methods, including quantitative. So here they have the skills that they're using. Oftentimes this person also has a skills section down at the bottom. Uh, employers like to see things listed not only in skills, but um, also in the bullet points themselves. So do uh, sometimes it's nice to actually repeat some information. 
wrote 300 page dissertation, peer reviewed article, presented conference papers. So again, breaking down, what did you actually do within your graduate education? Here, this person has uh, put also their teaching assistant and graduate instructor um, and kind of condensed all of their teaching experiences into one experience with a couple of bullet points. And then again, kind of highlighting again, skills that they have re uh, related to the job. So we said social sciences, right? So they're saying drawing in literature from sociology, political science, anthropology, and history, all social sciences. And then this person has volunteer writers. So again, featuring volunteer opportunities in the experience section uh, and really highlighting specific things that they've done that are related to the job. And then we're going to graduate assistant, uh, graduate union representative. So again, those, uh, those, those activities that you've done during your graduate education. And then here they actually list their publications as well, just selected, not everything probably, right? And then again, selected conference presentations, and then additional skills. So we're showing SPS, SPSS, Excel, um, Stata, and then demographic methods, uh, intensive seminar and social science research methods. So again, kind of like highlighting these skills that you have. This person doesn't necessarily have language, but they've done a really nice job with the skills section. And this is two pages, right? And this is for data and analysis research roles. So it makes sense. So again, I just wanted to go ahead, go to PhD, imaginephd.com. Again, completely free to sign up. You will never receive spam messages from Imagine PhD, which is kind of amazing in the day and age where as soon as you sign up for a website, they sell your information to another company. They will not do that. Imagine PhD was developed by career development professionals who work throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, for the exact reason of helping graduate students with their education. So do sign up. This is for the humanities and social sciences, but we really strongly recommend that STEM students also check out this website. It can be very helpful. All right, so let's go back to our presentation now that we have a better understanding of tailoring. And if you ever have further questions about how to tailor, is your document tailored, make an appointment with us at GSAS Compass. Finally, I want to end with how do you follow up on your applications. So I strongly suggest that you create a spreadsheet for all the places that you've applied to help keep track. So maybe on the left side, you want to have the company name, maybe you want a column for if you have a contact there, if you're going to be doing some networking, maybe a column for application, first follow up, second follow up, things like that. Keep yourself organized. And then if you apply directly to an email address, you can follow up with that email address and ask them, can I check on the status of my application? Um, I like to do that maybe every 10 business days and I'll do that for up to three times. I know some people who follow up and follow up and follow up and follow up past three times. That's if you're comfortable with that, but I typically use the rule of three. If you're applying through a job portal, it's much harder to follow up. Um, oftentimes, there's just not a specific person monitoring it. Um, so do keep in mind that once you've kind of added it to the portal, you might be able to find a jobs at company.com that you can follow up with. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, sometimes it, it can be harder. Uh, I guess, you know, I do think that this is an important part of the job search, but I also think that some companies don't want you following up and they'll list that in the job description. So again, use your best judgment here. Um, and if I think that following up can show interest, can show that you're someone who's really self-motivated and, you know, really wants to show their interest in a company, um, but sometimes it's not the, the right move. So again, use your, your critical thinking skills here. And then be patient. Reviewing applications takes time. In my own personal experience, I remember applying for a job and then three months later getting a response for an interview. It took them that long to review applications. So again, um, offices are now short staffed in almost every industry. Uh, we hear about people being short staffed, looking for workers. Um, and so oftentimes the hiring manager or recruiter, um, you know, has a lot of, uh, you know, they're Maybe they're, they're overseeing many, many projects, many, many hirings. Um, so try and be patient. Just expect that sometimes it takes a long time to review applications. Sometimes you'll get a response right away, but that's not always common. And then finally, expect the process to be challenging. It will be. Um, we say for right now, for most people, it's probably going to take six months or maybe more to find a job. Um, so 
uh, you know, you kind of have to searching for a job is really difficult. That's why our office exists to help you with this process. And so um, make sure that you're also taking care of your own, you know, mental health during this process. Um, don't, you know, just spend all day applying to jobs, take breaks, limit your, your work hours to applying to jobs. Um, so just, you know, understand that this, this will take time. And then, as I said, don't give up. You can always make an appointment with us at GSAS Compass. We will be your personal cheerleaders to help you through this, this difficult process of searching for a job. Um, so, you know, don't be shy, come back, ask questions. And I hope that this presentation, you've walked away with a clear understanding of what makes a compelling resume, what an applicant tracking system is, and how to tailor your document. Please do, as I mentioned, contact us with further questions. Thanks so much for watching this recording, and we hope to see you soon.